Well, uh, Thomas, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's almost as if I could have written it myself, uh, <laughs> the way you delivered it. Um, but thank you very much. Um, thanks to uh, Jerome Sabayan for all the efforts to make my visit here possible, uh, to Bob for escorting me this morning, and to all of you, above all, uh, for the generous gift of your time this morning. Uh, I regard it as a very real privilege uh, and honor for me to be back at the United States Army War College. I had the uh, privilege of taking part in the Commandant's National Security Seminar last year, just about a year ago, in July uh, of last year, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the warmth of, uh, and the hospitality that was demonstrated to me and all the other civilian participants was uh, something that left a very deep impression on me, and I'm delighted to be back. Uh, in the course of my career, both in the United States Department of State and now even at the East-West Institute, uh, I've often had the opportunity to work very closely with the United States military. When I was at U.S. embassies overseas, I had the opportunity uh, to work with defense attaches offices and on visits of senior Department of Defense officials and so on. <clears throat> and now at the East-West Institute, I've had the opportunity and continue to have the opportunity to work with very distinguished senior military, uh, former senior military officers and current Pentagon officials uh, in the work that we do uh, in terms of Track 2 diplomacy. By the way, I should note that Track 2 diplomacy, for those that may not be familiar with the term, is a big part of what we do at the East-West Institute. And basically, it's the bringing together of folks that are proximate to power but not currently in power who can surface and, and bring to the table new and innovative ideas and policy workarounds to vexing international challenges, sometimes to things that are uh, seen as intractable by governments. And we bring folks together from, let's say, the United States and China, the United States and Russia, and so on, to try to come up with innovative workarounds and then present those ideas to those in power with the ability to make policy and change policy. And that's the nature of what we do at EWI. But I have to say also, on a personal note, uh, having an opportunity to spend time with all of you this morning and to be involved generally in the work of the United States Army War College is a privilege for me at a personal level because uh, a number of members of my family over the years have, like you, worn the uniform of our nation. Uh, my father, who was in the United States Air Force and was an officer, a lieutenant, uh, and two uncles, a sister, and a nephew all of whom were in the United States Army, which I understand is well represented in the ranks today. Uh, and so uh, there are generations of, of members of my family who, like you, have worn the uniform. And I just want to say I have tremendous respect, appreciation, and admiration for all that you do in the service of our nation. So with that uh, kind of set of personal comments, let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the topic I'd like to discuss this morning. And if I had to give it a formal title, and I know that I think it's, it was listed originally as the Russia-China Nexus, and I'll talk about that in a second. But actually, I kind of shifted gears, and while there will be a Russia and China component to what I talk about this morning, it'll be a little bit bigger picture than just Russia and China. And so if I were giving a formal title to the talk that I'm giving this morning, it would be the X factor, that is EX, the X factor, colon, exceptionalism and major international conflict in the 21st century. That's the topic that I want to talk about. And it basically attempts to address a very profound issue, one that it would seem is difficult to get one's arms around, uh, at least initially. And that is the very basic question that I think is very salient to the work that you're doing in your rigorous two-year course here. And that is, why do international conflicts, in particular, why do major international conflicts occur? Um, that's bigger than the United States, that's bigger than China, than Russia. All of us, I think, understand at some level that we are living in a world today that is particularly tumultuous. I think there are a lot of observers, myself included, that would say that uh, at first glance it would appear that we are living in a, a more tumultuous period of time from the standpoint of international security than we have perhaps seen except during a time of general world war. You've got Russia, Ukraine, you've got everything that's happening in the Middle East, including but not limited to the Islamic State, issues in Syria, Iraq, 
Libya for that matter. You've got China, South China Sea, the issue of Taiwan is always out there, the dispute with Japan and the East China Sea is out there, and a, a whole host of issues that are very, very complex and very challenging. And so the question I'm posing is, why is all of this happening and is there a common strand? Now, how did I get to this particular topic? I want to just say a couple of words by way of explaining sort of how I came to start looking at the issue of exceptionalism and the role that exceptionalism plays in major international conflict in the 21st century. A little over a year ago, in April of last year, I was giving a talk at Michigan State University. Uh, and in fact, the talk was on the topic of U.S.-Iran relations, which is another of the issues in my portfolio. By the way, just as a parenthetical aside, uh, I don't know what I did in a past life to deserve to work on U.S. China, U.S. Russia, and U.S. Iran all at the same time. Uh, but whatever it was, I sure hope and I presume that I had a lot of fun doing it <laughs> because it has definitely uh, been a challenging set of issues but also an exhilarating set of issues to work on. But I was giving this talk at Michigan State University and in the course of my comments, um, I was um, noting, uh, people were sort of wondering how it was that I worked on these three particular bilateral relationships at the same time, which would be a natural question. And so I was trying to explain, well, you know, the, the thing that I think holds these things together, the strand, the common strand that binds together these particular three bilateral relationships, is that there is a very profound deficit of strategic trust between all three pairs of nations. U.S. China, U.S. Russia, U.S. Iran. I think even for those that haven't delved deeply into China, Russia, or Iran, we probably all intuitively understand that that is true, that there is a major trust deficit. But then I said something that was not something I had said before or necessarily consciously thought before, but it kind of came to me in the spur of the moment. And it was another common strand, and I mentioned it, and it sort of stuck with me. And that is the common strand that with these three bilateral relationships, you're actually de dealing with three pairs of countries in which both countries in each pair self-identify as exceptional nations. So we often talk about the United States as an exceptional nation. In fact, presidents of both parties, going back a long period of time, often explicitly refer to the United States as either an exceptional nation or sometimes even the exceptional nation. So that is part of who we think of ourselves and we, we know that. There are many articles written about it. Uh, there are books written about American exceptionalism, its sources, its implications, and so on. The thing that I think is not so much appreciated and I think represented a kind of insight in that moment as I was speaking in Michigan is that there are other nations in the world that also self-regard and self-identify as exceptional. And it happens that China, Russia, and Iran are three of those nations. Now even for those who haven't looked at these three particular countries, you probably can get an intuitive sense of what I'm talking about uh, just by looking at the behavior of these three countries as well as the United States in the world. And so I kind of felt that I stumbled onto something. And from that point, I started looking a little bit more systematically at the issue of exceptionalism and the role it plays in generating international conflict. And so what I'd like to do with that general preface is to uh, explore the role of exceptionalism in particular uh, in international conflict and to lay out specifically the following several topics. So let me map out what I'm going to talk about this morning with you. And recognizing that I do very much intend uh, to leave a good amount of time for your questions and our discussion. And by the way, I should also note, I very much look forward to continuing the discussion uh, in Jerome's class later and also over a brown bag lunch. But the topics that I'll talk about now are in this order, uh, first of all, some, a brief reference to a few of the theories of conflict that have been presented over about the last 25 years. And I won't go into great depth, but I do think it's important to lay out a backdrop uh, for sort of what attempts have been made thus far to try to understand and rationalize international conflict. The second thing I'll talk about is what I call the common denominators or common elements of major 
international conflict. Um, and in that context, I'll say a little bit about the methodology that I have been employing to try to get my arms around this issue. The third point that I'll make, and I'll go into some detail on, is specifically the issue of exceptionalism. So having said that there are, and I'll, I'll talk about this momentarily, a number of common denominators to conflict, uh, the one that I'm going to spend the most time talking about, as the title of the talk, if you will, implies, is exceptionalism. And here I'll lay out a basic working definition of exceptionalism. I will discuss the types or categories of exceptionalism, which I think is not something that's been done. And I'll also say, in my judgment, what it is about exceptionalism that uh, tends to get countries more um, often into conflict than countries that do not regard themselves as exceptional. I'll briefly make reference to a few cases. That will be the next uh, part. I won't have time to go into all the detail, but I hope that we'll have a chance to deal with the cases and other issues in question and answer. And then I'll talk about uh, briefly uh, what the implications are of this X factor theory, if I can call it that, for policymakers and for defense, plan uh, de defense planners. And finally, uh, I'll offer a few concluding thoughts. When I finish at about 6 p.m. Uh, tonight, <laughs> Um, we will then have a robust Q&A uh, session over dinner. No, but I, I will make a good faith effort to try to, uh, to complete all of that uh, in a little under an hour, and I'll put my watch here to try to keep me on track. So with that, let me, let me speak briefly about three theories of conflict in particular, but even as a preface to that, to make a couple of general observations. Um, there are a lot of efforts to try to make sense of why conflict occurs. And again, here I'm looking at major international conflict, and I should note I'm not looking at cases of domestic unrest. And there are a lot of instances of domestic unrest that is more or less wholly contained within the borders of a nation. But the nature of that beast is different from international conflict for a lot of reasons. And so I'm looking at the international piece, not the domestic piece. But a lot of folks have tried to offer theories, some more simple, some more complex, as to why international conflict occurs. So for example, at a very simplistic level, some will hypothesize that international conflict occurs when interests of significant international players are in disalignment, when they're not aligned. <clears throat> um, at one level, that seems intuitive and almost, almost a truism. On the other hand, uh, there are an enormous number of instances, uh, myriad, countless I would say, in which countries' interests do not align but the countries are not fighting a war. In fact, they're not even close to significant international conflict. So that doesn't seem to be the only factor at play. It may be a factor, but if it were the only factor, then most of the world, including the US and Canada, and a lot of other countries that you wouldn't expect would be at war over fisheries or over various issues. So even when interests don't align, that doesn't seem to explain it all. Some have hypothesized that democracies don't fight each other which, insofar as it goes, I think is largely true, particularly today, and I think has generally been true. But it also then doesn't explain why the countries that do fight each other do fight each other. So it explains part of the problem, but not all of the problem. Now here, let me make reference to three particular theories that have been put forward by significant voices and scholars. Um, and I'll be very brief, but it'll give you a backdrop for the discussion, uh, the rest of the discussion, which will focus in on basically what I would call my theory of why major international conflict occurs. So first, let me talk about Francis Fukuyama and the notion of the end of history. Um, Francis Fukuyama uh, was a very distinguished scholar, also a former government official, uh, that put forth in 1989 and 1990, first it was an article in Foreign Affairs and or in another publication, maybe The National Interest, then it was a book. And it was the idea that with the end of the Cold War, uh, basically, the fundamental uh, fulcrum for major international conflict in the world had kind of disappeared. Basically, to summarize, we won, they lost, democracy triumphed, dictatorship was discredited, market economics were seen as being the right solution, centralized planning was seen as being a failed solution or a, failed, uh, a failure. And so, there, in a sense, in, in a broad in a sweeping sense, uh, sort of looking at all of human history and sort of where humanity was going, uh, 
Fukuyama's contention was that there wouldn't be any inherent reason to have major international conflict anymore with the end of the Cold War. Now, I won't spend a lot of time saying what I think is obvious to all of us, and that is while the idea seemed very interesting and frankly very compelling at the time, and I certainly bought into it, uh, as frankly as a student in 1989, um, it's clear that history hasn't yet quite come to an end. In fact, uh, one can now, I think, credibly debate whether the entire construct is valid or not. Uh, but in any case, one thing that is clear, and that I think even Mr. Fukuyama would grant, is that the notion that history ended in 1989 has been disproven. With a lot of different examples we could cite, to, we could cite but one very obvious example is 911, uh, radical uh, Islam or Islamism, and the profound challenges that are out in the world, to say nothing of some of the tensions uh, involving China, to say nothing of Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So there are any number of cases that would suggest that that idea seemed to be the right idea at the time, but was later proven to not have a very high degree of explanatory value. On the heels of that theory, a gentleman named Samuel Huntington put forth the idea of the clash of civilizations. You've probably heard of this or perhaps studied it here uh, in your program. And by the way, as a parenthetical aside, let me just say uh, congratulations to all of you for being one week away from finishing the first year of a very rigorous two years of study. Uh, I salute you. I don't think I could do what you are doing. Uh, and I really have a lot of admiration for folks that can do work, family, and a very rigorous course of professional military education. So I, my hats are off to you. Um, but coming back to the issue of Huntington, and you may have touched on that in some of your studies, his basic thesis is there, that there was a uh, there was and is a geo-civilizational set of fault lines that basically go along civilizational lines and that it's along these geo-civilizational fault lines that the uh, conflicts of the future, and he was writing in 1993, in fairness, that it's along these fault lines that conflicts of the future would occur. Well, again, it seemed intuitive. It seemed to pick up where Fukuyama left off. It seemed to recognize that there was still conflict in the world which, by the way, was already clear by 1993, to say nothing of 2001, to say nothing of 2015. And so there was an intuitive appeal to this argument. Uh, however, uh, it became clear over time that there seemed to be a couple of flaws in this argument as well. One of the main flaws is uh, that if you look at the world in the context of geo-civilizational blocks, such as the United uh, North America and Western Europe as one, Confucian East Asia, Africa, Latin America, Russia's in its own category, South Asia, and so on. What you recognize is that there are actually very few conflicts between most of those blocks. So if the idea was that the only thing that drove conflict was geo-civilizational divides, then you would expect that there would be conflict and tensions along pretty much all of the geo-civilizational fault lines. But there aren't. So that's one of the flaws. And of course, perhaps more fundamentally, uh, a flaw with the argument is that now what we see very clearly is that even within some of the geo-civilizational blocks, you see conflict within the blocks, which according to Huntington's theory shouldn't be possible. So for example, within the Islamic world, you have Sunni and Shia um, is, is, Islam, and there is a profound level of mistrust and even open conflict between those uh, branches, if you will, of the faith of Islam, uh, to, you know, which is best exemplified by one particular example, and that is the extraordinary uh, enmity and animosity between Saudi Arabia, for example, and Iran. And there are other examples one could cite. So according to the theory of the clash of civilizations, this shouldn't be happening. So I would say that I think it's pretty clear that that doesn't explain everything either. The third thing I would mention perhaps hits closer to home for uh, this military, predominantly military audience, and that is uh, the work of a gentleman named Thomas Barnett, who was at the U.S. Naval War College and produced a very thoughtful book called The Pentagon's New Map. And his basic argument was that the profound issue in the world is that some, uh, from a security standpoint, is that some countries are connected, most countries, in fact, are connected, and some countries and entities are disconnected. By the term connected, he meant connected to the global economy, to the process of globalization, 
to international labor markets, to international markets for goods and services, to international investment flows, and perhaps equally importantly, to international information flows and to the internet itself. Now, Barnett was writing, I think, in 2006, 2007. Um, meanwhile, the disconnected are not really connected to any of those things. They're not connected to the economy, the global economy, to markets, uh, or to information flows, and so on. Um, again, seemingly a very intuitive and thoughtful explanation, absolutely a thoughtful body of work, worthy of study, as are all the others that I mentioned. But here again, you see some examples that would seem to disprove the general validity of that theory. Namely, uh, two things. One, we're actually seeing an increasing number of instances where, uh, well, his basic thesis, I should say, was that countries that are connected, led by the United States, or with the United States as, if you will, the most connected country in the world in every sense, uh, would have to mind the gap, or if you will, would have to mind what I think he termed the ozone hole of connectedness in the world, and basically would have to, in a sense, serve as a systems administrator, including in a military sense, dealing with problems generated from the disconnected world. That was the thesis. The problem with that is twofold. That number one, uh, what seemed like the disconnected world in 2006, in many cases, is no longer disconnected in a number of different ways. One example I would cite that I think makes the point pretty emphatically is ISIS. Uh, ISIS is not disconnected. Uh, they obviously have a value set that is profoundly at odds with the civilized world. However, uh, they're on Twitter, they're on YouTube, and they're, they're anything but disconnected relative to the media and social media. In fact, it's because, arguably, to some degree, that they're connected and that they can get their horrible message out to the world as effectively as they do that they are front and center in the national security psyche of our nation and many others. So the idea of countries that were disconnected being the problem doesn't account for the fact that you still have some profound problems that involve connected entities or states. But also, among the sort of conventionally connected world that Barnett wrote about, uh, you see conflicts brewing there as well. So for example, China and Japan are both connected countries. However, they're very much at odds over East China Sea, the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands dispute, and the notion of disconnectedness does not explain that conflict. It doesn't explain the Russia-Ukraine conflict. It doesn't explain entirely the Israel-Iran tensions over the nuclear issue and a host of others. So my point is, there are a lot of good bodies of work out there, and I have a lot of respect for each of these gentlemen and for the work that they've done. However, it's very clear that these things don't fully explain why conflict happened. And because of that, I want to offer an, an alternative analysis that, again, I refer to as the X factor, and it's the idea that what really explains international conflict, for the most part, is the notion of exceptionalism. And that's not an idea that has been out there, but is one that I'm now presenting to you. By the way, I should note that I've uh, given uh, rough versions of this talk to much smaller groups of folk, folks, uh, including former military and others, to kind of lay out these ideas and get some feedback. But this is the first major setting in which I've given this talk. And I wanted it to be that way. And I, frankly, very much look forward to your critical commentary and feedback because uh, this is uh, very valuable to me as I continue to formulate these ideas. Now what I'd like to do is uh, segue to kind of the heart and soul of this presentation and talk about, at this point, the key common denominators, as I see them, of major international conflict. Now, let me point out again, uh, what I'm talking about is not fact, per se, although I support my views with facts and with evidence. But what I'm talking about is a thesis. It's an argument. It's a, it's a hypothesis or a theory that I've crafted as to why international conflict occurs. So I'm making statements, but I'm cognizant that they're normative judgments that I'm making. They may be right or they may be wrong. My judgment is that they have a high degree of explanatory value, and that's why I'm sharing them with you. Uh, but it's, it's, in the, it's in the spirit of presenting a theory that uh, certainly will be tested over the years. Now, with that said, uh, just a word about the methodology that I employed. 
as I said, the issue for me was the issue and is the issue of why major international conflict occurs. So what I did very simply is starting back with that April speech at Michigan State University and, and the, 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 the idea that sort of crystallized in my mind at that time, I asked myself two questions. And that is, where are the major international hotspots? And also, where are the major potential international hotspots or potential major international conflicts? That's question one. And secondly, what are the things that those conflicts seem to have in common? And that's the basic sort of, uh, if I can call it a Texas two-step uh, methodologically that I employed to say, you know, where are the conflicts, what do they have in common, and what comes out of that? And so that's how I approach the issue. Uh, let me share with you the results of my analysis, at least thus far. So there are five things, I think, that major international conflicts have in common. And let me start with what I think is the most basic and then kind of work up in orders uh, uh, toward a higher level of conceptual complexity. The last point will be exceptionalism, and I will drill down on that point. But let me start with point number one. Point number one is uh, to have a conflict, it goes without saying, you have to have at least two parties. Uh, and again, here we're talking about international conflict, not domestic. And so you've, you've got to have two parties and basically at least one international line involved. But the first point I would make is you have to have at least one state involved. Now that may sound almost uh, like a truism, but think about the world that we see today. Uh, there are an awful lot of state actors, but there are also an awful lot of increasingly significant non-state actors. My contention is that you will not see a major international conflict, and we don't see one today, that involves only non-state actors. So to have a major international conflict, my contention is, and my thesis is, you have to have at least one state among the parties to the conflict, even if the other is a non-state actor. So you have to have one state. Point number two is that of the two parties involved in the conflict, at least one of them has to be a non-democracy. Now that could be the state or it could be a non-state actor. If it's two states, it could be one, it would have to be one of the two states. If it's a state and a non-state actor, it could be the state or more likely, almost always, would be the non-state actor, uh, which virtually always are non-democracies. Uh, they're not states, but even in, insofar as their internal governance is concerned, they're not by any means democratic. So you have to have a non-democracy. And this goes back to this idea that I touched on earlier, which has been a truism that many have talked about for many years, and that's the idea that democracies generally don't fight each other. And I think there is a lot of truth to that. The way I would state it, is that the greatest force for peace in the world is a voting public. When you have a voting public, the likelihood that that nation and that public will send itself or its children or its grandparent, uh, grandchildren uh, into war is pretty low. They don't do it frivol frivolously. We do it, but we don't do it frivolously. And uh, when you have two nations that are democracies and where leadership is accountable to electorates, uh, then the likelihood is, if you will, geometrically lower. Um, when I talk about non-democracies, I sometimes use the term, for purposes of this body of theory, uh, non-democratic uh, electoral accountability, NDEA. This is just a term I coined sort of for, for my research purposes because I'm not trying to make a moral judgment for purposes of this theory about whether a country is a democracy or not. I'm not saying it to shame or slam anyone. What I'm saying is that a country that lacks democratic electoral accountability is more likely to get into conflict than one that has it. So a non-democracy has to be in the mix. That's point two. The third point is that you have to have a relative, at least, at least a, a slight but palpable disparity in power between the parties that are parties to the conflict. My general contention is that if countries or non-state entities feel that they are almost identically matched from the standpoint of military power and other forms of national power, they're unlikely to go into conflict because they're unlikely to believe that they can triumph. There are exceptions to that, but generally you have to have at least one of the parties feeling that it can win before you're going to have a conflict. 
Now, by the same token, I tend to say uh, that on the other side of the ledger, uh, you almost never have conflicts between countries that are massively more powerful than their would-be opponent. And the example I use, just as an illustrative point, is you would never have a war between the United States and Fiji. Because frankly, the United States would never need to go to war with Fiji to get anything we ever wanted from Fiji or from the Marshall Islands or any small, tiny nation. That is self-evident. We could use any number of other means short of warfare to get what we want. And that's just an illustrative point that suggests that when you get beyond a certain disparity of power, Today, and this hasn't always been true, because there have been instances historically where big countries beat up on little countries, but today I think it's generally not seen as uh, necessary to go to war with a very small country. So there is a bandwidth which, within which conflict occurs, and it's where there is some disparity but not too great a disparity of power. Now there are two caveats I would add to this third commonality of, of conflict. The first caveat is what I call the nuclear caveat. And the nuclear caveat is basically the following. When both powers, however disparate they may be overall in their national power, both have nuclear arsenals. And when the weaker power can credibly deliver a nuclear strike upon the, the stronger power, notwithstanding the fact that the stronger power is stronger, then in that instance you are unlikely to have conflict because the concept of nuclear deterrence comes into play. And so just as an example, and it, I, I just use it to illustrate the conceptual point, uh, the United States and China are both nuclear powers. Uh, the United States has a couple of thousand nuclear warheads, China perhaps has a couple of hundred. So there's not parity, but there is, uh, there is a capability on the part of China to deliver a nuclear strike to the United States, the continental United States. And because of that, the likelihood that the United States and China any time in the foreseeable future would ever come into conflict is, I would say, low to non-existent because there is a nuclear threshold there, potentially. So the nuclear caveat, I think, is in play. There's another caveat, and that is I said that big, big, you know, very large countries don't tend to beat up on small countries. I think the exception to that is when the smaller entity is a non-state actor, uh, such as, for example, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, uh, although the Taliban was in power at the state level at one point, they're not now, um, and obviously ISIS now. In those instances, in, in our experience, what we see is that nation states are willing to go full on, uh, if necessary, to tackle those non-state challenges. Uh, so that is an exception to the, to, the, to the rule that I noted about big countries generally not going after smaller ones. So with those caveats, I think, nevertheless, there is a power disparity issue there. The fourth and fifth points, I think, are at the heart of my argument. And I'll just be brief, and then I'll go into uh, one of these issues, namely exceptionalism, uh, in some detail. The fourth point is, goes to the issue of why countries actually fight. Now, let me be a little provocative here, and this may go against the grain of, of certainly some of the literature that's out there that talks about uh, conflicts. Uh, may go against the grain of some other speakers that you've had. Uh, but let me, let me start by offering what I think are reasons that countries do not go to war or that do not get into international, major international conflict. Countries don't get into major international conflict over vital national security interests. What do they do with vital national security interests? They talk about them. They say, this is a vital national security interest. And the other one says, well, if that's a vital national security interest, then, then so is this interest on our side. And the concept of vital national security interest is something people talk about. It's not actually something people generally fight over. That may seem counter-conventional, but if you look at what's happening in the world, I think you'll see a lot of cases lend support to that. Countries don't fight over food or water or energy, generally speaking, at least today. And in recognizing that today why countries go to war is different than perhaps why they did 500 years ago or 200 years ago or 50 years ago. And it's an, it's an always evolving thing. But generally, if a country has its population, is in a predicament in which its population is starving, chances are the population is starving because of what the government is doing to the people in the first place. It's not something countries go to war over. They don't go to war, to put it crassly to make a point, over so, something so trivial as their people starving. Um, 
they basically go to war for two reasons. Two kinds of reasons, I would say. And arguably, there may be a third out there that I'm still thinking about, maybe we can talk about. But I would, I, I would offer to you today that there are two reasons countries get into major international conflicts. The first is when a country or, in the case of a non-democracy, a regime, believes that there is an existential threat to its existence as a country or as a regime, particularly in a non-democratic context, a country will fight. A country will get into conflict and will fight to the end to save itself. That, I think, is clear and that, I think, is self-evident. But existential interests are why countries fight, not merely vital interests, not merely grave uh, or serious interests or major interests. They fight when their existence is in question. But the second reason that I would argue that countries fight is one that I think is not talked about a lot. And that is what I would call, and I think I've coined this term, but I, I can, I, I'll look it up. Um, they fight over identity interests. They fight over identity interests. And what does that mean? It means that every country has a very particular and normative and subjective sense for who it is as a nation. Who it is as a nation among nations. And when a country challenges that sense of its identity, the country that is feeling challenged will go to war. It will fight over identity. Won't fight over food, won't fight over water. There's never been a war over water. It won't fight even over energy because the market will tend to resolve those issues, quite frankly. We'll pay a little bit more at the pump, but the market will resolve it a lot more cheaply than a war will. But what they do fight over is the issue of identity. What do I mean by that? Let me give you a couple of examples. I won't dwell on them, but, I, but to make the point. Uh, China regards Taiwan as a part of China, as a part of its sovereign jurisdiction. Obviously, Taiwan has its own views on the matter. But from a Chinese standpoint, even though China does not exercise de facto control over Taiwan, and it does not, and I know there, there is a, tai, you know, a Taiwan student here, um, Nevertheless, China would go to war and certainly enter into a major international conflict over any attempt by Taiwan to go independent. Not because that fundamentally affects China's interests per se, but because it offends and outrages China's sense of identity. It cannot abide a scenario, and I believe this, in which it loses Taiwan. So it is an identity interest, and arguably, and I think it's also true, it is seen as an existential interest from China's standpoint because it is also, I think, widely viewed that the regime that loses Taiwan is probably going to be the last communist leadership in China's history. That's their assessment uh, that you will sometimes hear privately. So for those two reasons, I think it's a good illustration of this notion of identity and, and existential interest. On the Russia side, uh, among other factors, one of the reasons that Russia felt compelled to take Crimea back, uh, and, and, and again, as we know, Crimea was effectively annexed back into the Russian, or into the Russian Federation a little over a year ago. Uh, there was a sense of identity deep within the Russian heart that Crimea should, by rights, be part of Russia. And there was a sense that, that, that its sense of identity depended on Crimea coming back to the fold. These are the reasons, and I think these are examples, of tensions and potential tensions and potential conflicts and real conflicts that are keyed to the issue of identity. So existential interests, identity interests. The final point is exceptionalism. And I would say that this is the fifth, but also the most important ingredient for international conflict. I would call exceptionalism, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail here, uh, essentially the active ingredient for major international conflict in the world today. If you have the first four but you don't have the last, you probably don't have major international conflict. You have to have a country that self-defines as exceptional to at least one, at least one party to the conflict to get into a conflict. That is my central assertion. Now, let me make one point very clear before I go into a, def a sort of a definition of exceptionalism and talk a little bit about what I see as the three, three main categories of exceptionalism. And that is that when I use the term exceptionalism, I am not saying that that is my judgment. 
I'm not saying I, David, believe that country A or B or C is exceptional. I may have my views, but that's irrelevant. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that country A or B or C defines themselves as exceptional. That's the point that I'm making. So when I say an exceptional nation, remember, I'm not imposing my judgment. I'm offering my judgment as to what they see in themselves. Now, some may dispute my assessments, but I think the assessments uh, are accurate. And in most cases, leaving aside America, which is my country, uh, they're pretty dispassionate and pretty objective because the countries that I'm talking about are not, with the exception of the United States, my country. Now, let me give you a basic working definition of exceptionalism for purposes of this discussion. And that is basically the idea that the rules that apply to others don't apply to me. It's just that simple. That's exceptionalism. The rules that apply to others don't apply to me. I'm special. I get to go in the VIP entrance when everyone else goes in the other entrance. You stand in line. I don't stand in line. I get to do things my way. Uh, even if the rules say you can't do it, I can do it. I'm the exception. That's the mindset of an exceptional nation. <clears throat> and basically, it's a mindset uh, in which uh, the norms and the rules that apply to others you see yourself as being exempt from. Now, with that being said, I think it's still possible to say that there are different types of exceptionalism and the different types of exceptionalism tend to lead to different kinds of behavior on the part of nations or non-state entities. So let me talk a little bit about what I see as the three main types of exceptionalism. And in fact, I'll give a couple of examples of each one so that you see where I'm going with it. Uh, later, by the way, we'll touch on a few international hotspot examples to kind of illustrate some of these ideas. And we'll come to that in just a little bit. But the three basic types of exceptionalism are, number one, divine exceptionalism. And these are, to my knowledge, my terms. Um, secondly, what I call essential exceptionalism, but I also call it civilizational exceptionalism. That's the one and the same thing. And the third is excluded exceptionalism. Now, let me say a few words about what I mean about each one. Divine exceptionalism, pretty straightforward. A country that regards itself as divinely exceptional tends to believe that God is on its side. That's, that's what we're talking about. Tends to believe that, if you will, the, if I can coin a, a metaphor here, the breath of God is in its sails. I literally just made that up right now, but that's the, that, that, that was pretty good, wasn't it? Um, it? It literally believes that God is at its back, that what it is doing is God's will. Um, and therefore, quite by definition, it is exceptional because God isn't necessarily supporting everybody else or most others or anybody else. Now, what countries would I put in this category? Um, let me just list a couple of things, and we can drill down on this in discussion. But quite frankly, it may surprise you to hear this, but the first country that comes to my mind when I talk about this is the United States. And let, let's be honest. We think, and, and I'll, be, I'll be very candid, I think, but I think many of us think, that we are a nation blessed by God. Our, our presidents of both parties invoke God's blessings upon our nation and upon our people. The word God is on our money. The word God is in our oaths. As a foreign service officer, I took a sworn constitutional oath uh, to, to protect and defend the Constitution uh, on the Bible. Um, God is a part of who we are as a nation. The Judeo-Christian religious and civilizational tradition informs everything about this country. And I think we really do think as a nation that we are blessed by the good Lord. Now, we're one example. Uh, what are other examples of countries or entities that are out there that, for other reasons, in their own mindset, think that they're blessed by God? Well, ISIS is another one. They think they're blessed by God in their perverse way uh, and, and, and uh, just beyond imagination, uh, the, the mindset that they bring to the things that they do and the horrific things that they, that they perpetrate. Uh, they believe perversely, that they're blessed by God. Iran, as a theocracy, uh, by definition, believes that there is a God element in the very governance of the country because it is a self-proclaimed theocracy. Uh, 
Israel, arguably to a lesser degree than the others, has an element of this, but it actually is less pronounced than any of the three that I just mentioned. So there are a number of nations or non-state entities that are out there. And notice, I'm not saying that one is good or bad, because you have all kinds of different entities and organizations uh, and, and nations. What I'm saying is that these are nations and entities that feel that God is at their shoulder. Now, the second kind of exceptionalism is essential, or what I call civilizational. The reason I use the word essential is that these nations believe there's something about the essence of their nation that makes them special, exceptional, and to some degree superior relative to others, at least in a civilizational sense. Um, there's something about their his history, there's something about their achievements, there's something about um, uh, their size, there's something about them that makes them civilizational superior, civilizationally superior in their own judgment. Countries I would put in this category are, in no particular order, China. Uh, I'm not sure that the Chinese would necessarily agree at face value with my characterization, but I think that my characterization is accurate. And what I would also say is that any country that calls itself the Middle Kingdom, I think the burden of proof is on it to explain that it's not feeling exceptional. Um, so, I mean, that's a shorthand way of making the point. And I think that pr my, my sense is privately many Chinese would acknowledge that. Russia, I would place in this category. Iran, I would place in this category. Uh, arguably, the United States, which in, an, in another sense regards itself as exceptional, apart from the divine element. Perhaps Israel. Probably Turkey, which is, I think, a borderline exceptional nation, self-defined. Uh, these are the kind of countries that look at their civilizations in some cases, very long histories of civilization, and say there's something special about us that is different and that sets us apart from the world. And then there's a third kind of exceptionalism, and that's excluded exceptionalism. And this is an exceptionalism that is, in a sense, uh, imposed by others, because it's the exceptionalism that comes about when a country feels that it has been cast out of the civilized community of nations, rightly or wrongly. Obviously, the country probably feels it has been wrongly cast out and expelled from civilized society. But rightly or wrongly, they've been cast out, they've been put under sanctions, they are not in the United Nations, uh, they are condemned uh, with UN Security Council revolutions or by the Court of International Public Opinion, and they perceive themselves as being forced to sit at the kids' table, not the adults' table, being lepers, if you will, unwelcome. These are countries like North Korea, like Iran, up to the present, and Iran is an interesting case because this is on the cusp of changing, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but also, by the way, uh, quite frankly, uh, Taiwan, which uh, is, if you will, an entity. Uh, many countries don't recognize Taiwan as a nation, but, it, but whatever you call it, whether nation or whether entity or whether renegade province or whatever term you want to use, it is a self-governing island entity with 23 million and with its own government, its own military, its own currency and so forth, and its own foreign relations, meets the traditional definition of a state in any case. And it's not in the United Nations, and it's in a sense been expelled from a lot of international society uh, because of the sovereignty dispute with China and because China sits at the table in the United Nations and is in a position to ensure that Taiwan cannot be represented there. So that's another case where you have a kind of excluded mindset. Cuba historically was, I think, in that mindset, but that's changing now with normalization. So those are the kinds of countries that I think, maybe that's not an exhaustive list, but that's pretty close. Divine exceptionalism, essential or civilizational exceptionalism, and excluded exceptionalism. Um, let me make three basic points about this before transitioning to um, a couple of other points about why exceptionalism tends to generate a higher proclivity for conflict. Um, number one is you don't have to be in one or the other category. You could be in all three categories. So for example, the United States is in two of the three. We're certainly not excluded. But we do consider, I would argue, we, we, we think that we are a divinely exceptional nation. I think we also think we are exceptional civilizationally because we are a nation that has given expression to the ideas of the Constitution and before that, the Declaration of Independence. And so we feel very special in a civilizational sense. I think Israel is probably 
in two or arguably three of the categories. I think Iran is in three of the categories. I think, uh, I think North Korea is probably in two. It's, it doesn't consider itself divinely exceptional per se because it's nominally an atheistic society, but they project a lot of that sense of, of, of what we might call God or higher power onto some of their historical leadership. So there's almost an element of that. But they're arguably in at least two categories. So you don't have to be in one or the other. And my basic contention is that the more categories you're in, the more of a problem you are from the standpoint of having a proclivity to get into major international conflict. And by that, I'm not saying you are a bad nation. I, because frankly, even the United States is in more than one category, and Israel is in more than one category, and, and, and others as well. Um, what I'm saying is that there is a higher likelihood for nations that self-regard as exceptional in more than one sense to uh, get into major international conflict. And I say that in a value-neutral way. The second point that I would make is that by going through that list, you start to see what the universe of exceptional nations looks like in terms of its scale. And the bottom line is it's about 15 countries. I've named most of them. There may be a couple of others, arguably Saudi Arabia. There's a question mark in my mind about India, but I, it, right now it doesn't make my list. A lot of the countries that do make the list I've already mentioned. And it goes somewhere between a dozen and 15 countries. My contention is that all major international conflict for the foreseeable future will involve one or more of those 15 countries, and none other. That exceptionalism is the active ingredient, and it's gonna, you're going to have at least one of those countries involved. In, in every conflict, in some cases two or more. And the third point that I would make generally is that if you've noticed, the only malleable or changeable type of exceptionalism is excluded exceptionalism. Because the others are really innate to, to the, a very normative but dug in and well established sense of national identity. I don't think anyone could, could, could persuade the American people that we are a nation that has not been blessed by God. I really don't think so. Yes, there are some folks that may think that, but I think the overwhelming majority of Americans will never be convinced otherwise. And likewise for the different other countries and examples that I've mentioned. They're in the bones, those ideas, those mindsets. But excluded exceptionalism is something that others impose on you. And just as it can be given, it can be withdrawn. That is that sense of excludedness. And just as you've been cast out, you can be brought back in. So the only really malleable uh, type of exceptionalism is excluded. Now, let me just say a few words, and I'm cognizant of the time constraints, so I'll try to condense down. Um, why is it that I think that exceptionalism tends to contribute to conflict um, to a greater degree than, 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 than countries that don't self-define as exceptional? Let me give you a few bullet points. Number one, if you think that the rules don't apply to you, almost self-evidently, you're more likely to get into conflict because most international rules prohibit conflict. If you think those rules don't apply to you, then you're going to have a higher likelihood to say, well, I can roll up my sleeves and put boots on the ground. Even if this agreement or that agreement or the United Nations Charter or whatever says that I can't, the fact is I can and I'm justified and I'm going to do it. And that's just the reality. So if you think that the rules don't apply, then the rules about conflict also don't apply. So that's, that's kind of self-evident. Secondly, um, exceptional nations, I think, generally, and again, whether they're democracies, non-democracies, whether they're the, quote, good guys, bad guys, however one might define those, and our views may be very different from the views of others, exceptional nations tend to feel righteous. They tend to feel they're right and others are wrong. And when you feel that you're right, uh, and others by definition are wrong if they don't agree with you, uh, then you, know, you tend to have a higher propensity to get into conflict. It's kind of that mindset, and I'm, I'm not making a political point, but I'm making a point about, let's say, the American sec security mindset. You're either with us or you're against us. I mean, there is no in-between. And so obviously if you're with us, you're right. We're right, and so we can do what we want because we're right. There is this mindset, and it's not partisan. I think all presidents and all U.S. administrations, re reflective of the values, I think, of the American people more broadly, have that mindset. Um, third point, 
exceptionalism tends to distort the lens through which countries tend to view their own interests. So what may seem like a vital interest to a non-exceptional country, the same interest may appear to be existential to an exceptional nation. Thus, the likelihood for conflict is higher. Fourth, by the same token, exceptionalism tends to distort the lens through which a country sees world opinion. So you may think, well, hey, uh, I'm right. Everybody you know, thinks like I do except for my enemies. Everyone must approve of what I'm doing. And to the relatively limited degree to which international public opinion may come into policymaking in any case, you may have a distorted view of what the world thinks of what you're doing. Now let me make a couple of points specific to the types of exceptionalism. Um, in the case of divine exceptionalism, you think that God is on your side. And if you think that God is on your side, you have a sense of destiny or, if you will, invincibility. Because it would be incongruous to think that God is on your side, but to also believe that you're going to lose. So this divine type of exceptionalism also contributes for that reason that there's a sense of destiny, invincibility, and to put it differently, the mindset is, we can't lose. In the case of excluded exceptionals, it's a different mindset. It's a mindset of, what do we have to lose? When you're on the outside looking in, when you're at the kids' table, not the adults' table, when you're the leper, when you have been cast out into the wilderness by the international community and even the United Nations, which doesn't always agree on everything, then the bottom line is, what do you have to lose? You're probably not very connected to the international economy. You're probably under sanctions. You're probably under all kinds of pressure from the media, NGOs, on human rights and other issues. So what difference does it make if we get into a conflict? Uh, you know, it's not going to get much worse than it already is. So what do we have to lose? Um, and then finally, in the case of, obviously, non-democracies or countries where there's an absence of democratic electoral accountability, uh, there really isn't an electoral constraint on the propensity to get into major conflict for reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, meanwhile, there's also a very deep-seated concern about regime stability, regime continuity, and in some cases, the maintenance of a monopoly on power. So, for those reasons, non-democracies, I think, do tend to get into conflict more often. Let me make brief reference to, uh, and I, I'm, I'm nearly done, uh, make brief reference to a couple of cases, uh, five cases, or I'll be very brief about each, that sort of illustrate uh, where these things come together. Now, these are cases that I think are current hotspots, uh, certainly either current conflicts or legitimate potential major international conflicts. And I think that what I would say in summary is that all of them have in common the five elements that I just described. One state, a non-democracy, in other words, at least one state, a non-democracy, uh, disparity of power within a certain bandwidth, existential and or identity interests at play, and exceptional players in the mix. That's what all these have in common. So in, in ascending order of volatility, that is with the most stable first and going to higher levels of volatility, Take the case, for example, of China. It's looking at three scenarios that are potential conflicts. Uh, potential conflicts. Uh, one is the broad issue of Taiwan. We've touched on that. That is a very real issue. It is an identity issue uh, for China. It's an identity issue for Taiwan. And by the way, both players are exceptional. Uh, and so you've got a fairly combustible scenario there. Um, you've got the dispute with, the, with Japan over the East China Sea. And, of course, you've got the South China Sea issues, which have very much been in the news lately and which I know you've read about and discussed. Um, the reason I consider this a relatively stable scenario is because of the nuclear caveat that I mentioned earlier. China is a nuclear power, and in, 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 in two of the three scenarios, East China Sea and South China Sea, at least one of the other players is also a U.S. ally, presumably covered by the U.S. nuclear umbrella, the likelihood that things involving Japan, or the Philippines at least, will get off the rails, I think, is low. Um, Taiwan is a different story. We won't delve into it. But um, I think China recognizes that the United States takes a great interest in what happens in Taiwan. That's clear. And I, I think that in a certain sense, um, the, the US-China nuclear dynamic probably plays a role there as well, as well as other constraining factors.
But those are all things where China could conceivably get into uh, significant international conflicts. Uh, second one, DPRK. Uh, I won't dwell on it, but I think the thing to keep in mind is we see some very alarming things happening on the Korean Peninsula. Um, alarming gestures, missile tests, nuclear tests, and so on. But the reality is, if you look at lo loss of life or any real damage done, has been relatively minimal com compared to the bark. It's not to minimize it entirely, but that it's mostly bluster, I think, and less likely to go off the rails in the immediate sense, partly because you've got major nuclear powers that don't want to see it go off the rails. For that matter, I must say, DPRK itself, at least on some level, is a nuclear power. It does have a small nuclear arsenal, very small. It has a very rudimentary ability to deliver those weapons, but it has some ability to deliver them. So there again, you have a scenario where there is a kind of deterrent effect. And I'm, it's an issue, but I'm less worried about it. The third example, I think, is Russia, Russia-Ukraine in particular. Um, there's been a lot of loss of life around the issue of Russia-Ukraine, over six, about 6,500 lives lost over the last year and a half. Uh, so there is real loss of life. Um, that being said, do I think it's really going to go off the rails and generate a full-on war with Russia? No. And the reason I think that is because ultimately the players involved are massive nuclear powers and they don't want to go down that road, and they're not going to. And the very fact, if you will, that Russia denies doing the things that the international community says that it's doing suggests that, at a minimum, Russia cares about optics enough to want to deny that it's doing these things, which in a certain positive sense means it at least nominally embraces some of these international norms and doesn't want to see this devolve into too, too much greater uh, a level of violence. Is it a worry? Absolutely. Do I think World War III will start with this? No. The fourth and fifth cases, I think, are more problematic. The fourth one is Iran and its nuclear power, uh, nuclear program. Um, do I worry that the United States and Iran are going to get into a war? No, I don't. Do I worry about the possibility of Iran and Israel getting into a war that then brings the United States in because Israel is a close and vital ally? That I worry more about. The reason is that for Iran, getting a nuclear weapons program is not actually an existential interest for them. It's something they want to do, and I would put it more in the identity and national pride category, but it's not fundamentally something they have to do to continue to live. The evidence of that is they've never had a nuclear program thus far, and they've been around for a long time. So they don't have to have it to live. So it's not existential by definition. However, Iran not getting a nuclear weapons program is existential to Israel because there is zero margin of error for Israel. It is a tiny place that would be devastated in the God forbid scenario of a nuclear attack. So their sense of existential uh, urgency is there. And you have both nations, in the case of Iran and Israel, that regard themselves as exceptional. Obviously a lot of distrust, animosity, very combustible mix. I see that as potentially the likeliest scenario of a state-to-state -state conflict that we probably see in the world today. Do I think it will happen? Not necessarily. Am I hopeful that it will not? Of course, all of us are. Do I hope that the negotiations can be successfully concluded and that everyone can walk away a winner, including the United States and Israel and Iran, because you're not going to get a deal if people don't think that they're walking away a winner? Yes, I hope for that. But I think that if you look at possibilities and degrees of likelihood, that's the state-to-state -state scenario I worry about the most. And then finally, there's the issue of ISIS. But ISIS is really a proxy for, if you will, radical Islam, radical Islamism, or whatever term what one might want to use. But it's a proxy for al-Qaeda, for the Taliban, for al-Shabaab, for Boko Haram, and the various other non-state radical players that are out there, terrorist organizations. Um, that is a case that obviously is very worry, uh, worrisome uh, and that the international community is coming together to a striking degree to try to deal with and combat. The very fact that countries like Arab nations and the United States and Europe and other players and even to some degree Iran itself are literally on the same side of this issue says a lot about the sense of urgency and the sense that this is something that needs to be dealt with 
uh, expeditiously and effectively. And that is a scenario that I think is going to be with us for quite some time and that obviously uh, could get worse before it gets better, but let's hope that, that, it, that it ultimately um, we do obviously prevail. Uh, now, with that all being said, uh, I think the, the final point that I want to make is simply to note that uh, this theory, if it is, if one accepts it as basically accurate or at least a legitimate way of looking at things unless and until someone comes and can disprove it, which will in, invariably and in, inevitably happen. Um, what is the value of this theory or this way of thinking about international conflict? A couple of things and, and I'll wrap up. Uh, number one, I think it gives policymakers a better understanding of what the real common denominators of conflict really are. We often think that it's this, it's that, it's a vital interest, it's food, it's water, it's it's the, it, we don't want oil prices going up too much and so forth and so on. The empirical evidence for the most part doesn't support any of those assertions. But if you look at simply where are the conflicts, what you do see is this common strand of identity interests, of existential interests. And these are very normative judgments. Let me also make a broad point here. The notion of national interests is itself a construct. It's constructed. It's not inherent. A national interest is a human construction. So if anyone ever talks about the notion of, well, objectively, country B has a national interest in A, B, or C, that statement on its face is oxymoronic. There is no such thing as an objective national interest. These are human constructions. They can change. They can evolve. And one example I would use just to illustrate the point, I won't dwell on it, um, most most of us would say at first value, if a country lobs missiles into your country, you get to do something in response, right? Well, when, when Iraq lobbed missiles into Israel, they did nothing in response. Now, any country would have been well within its rights, and I'm talking about the, the, the first Gulf War 20 plus years ago, would have been uh, within its rights to do something about that. But Israel chose not to. That's a good example of the fact that what would seem like an absolute slam dunk vital interest of fighting back when people are killing your people in your borders. They didn't do it, which illustrates that these are judgments that people make. And so interests, I think, a broad takeaway point is to think about interests as not being inherent or scientific, but being human constructions. Now, that said, I think this notion of identity and existential interests and the notion of exceptionalism is something that can help focus our policymakers on where the real problems are. As I said, I think if you buy this theory, that the real problems lie in about 15 nations. And about 175 nations, roughly, will never go to war. But about 15 of them is where all the problems are going to be. And they're not the same 15 that you get from Fukuyama, or from Huntington, or, or from Barnett. And that's, that's my contribution to this. It also suggests that some conflicts are going to be uh, very difficult to prevent because the issues you're dealing with are very fundamental. And uh, this goes back to the notion that certain types of exceptional exceptionalism are, yes, human constructions, but so innate that they would be impossible to change in the short run. So uh, the simple fact is uh, you're not going to change a divine sense of exceptionalism or an essential or civilizational sense you may be able to change the excluded sense, as I mentioned. But the fact is some things are going to be fundamentally uh, averse to any immediate policy or military solutions. Um, and I think the third point is that uh, potentially this kind of a theory uh, offers a tool, an analytical tool for defense planners to take another look, or let's say to use an alternative lens um, to say, you know, here's what we're thinking the, the conflicts are going to be. Let's apply this lens and see what is still on our list and see what's not on our list and, and see whether there might be something to this idea that, you know, as, as concerned as we are about Russia, we probably don't need to be planning aggressively for a U.S.-Russia war simply because of this body of this thesis, the idea of the nuclear caveat, and so on. Um, similarly, the things that are happening in the South China Sea, very alarming. But do we need to be assuming or preparing for war there? Uh, at one level, you always prepare for the worst. But on the other hand, there are choices that are made uh, 
particularly against the backdrop of tight budgets. So hopefully it can be another lens that can be applied to some of this analysis. Um, and I think that the, the final point I would make before just wrapping up is the, uh, this theory does, I think, successfully point to the two things that I think I'm worried most about and that I think most analysts probably are worried most about, with some exceptions. And that is the issue of Iran, which I think is a real issue that's out there. Hopefully it will go well, but the potential for conflict is there. And I mean major international state-to-state -state conflict. Um, and secondly, uh, the issue of ISIS and more generally radical Islam or Islamism. Uh, those are issues that I think are out there and that are the real frontline challenges. And they're frontline challenges because the players think of themselves as exceptional. And in all of those cases, they think of themselves as divinely exceptional. And that's the kind of exceptionalism that is hardest to root out because it is a core part of your sense of identity. So with that, I'll conclude by just saying this is a theory. I consider it a work in progress. Um, I feel privileged to have had the opportunity to share this with you here today. Uh, I'm grateful for your patience. I will be grateful for your critical commentary and thoughts. And I hope that what this does is provides an alternative viewpoint and an alternative lens that is different from some of the things that you may have heard and that looks at the issue of exceptionalism as being central to international conflict in the 21st century. Uh, hopefully this body of ideas will help all of us make a little bit more sense of a complex and conflicted world. And with that, I thank you all and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, in the red. Mike Klein, uh, 7R7. One of my bumper sticker takeaways, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears that Taiwan is a survival interest in the governance mindset of China and the maintenance of the acquisition of the ultimate assimilation of Taiwan is critical and essential. And if that's the case, and if that's accurate, do you see a tipping point via ambiguity and U.S. strategic messaging or a appearance in the global spectrum that the U.S. is withdrawing from? Do you see a catalyst in which China may take the initiative and try to um, integrate and assimilate Taiwan? Um, it's a very good question. I, uh, I do think that the mainland Taiwan issue is potentially a, a, a flashpoint in the world. I say potentially. I don't think it is going to uh, conflagrate anytime soon, but the ingredients are there just as I've described them, and I think anyone that looks at that using whatever matrix of analysis would come to the conclusion that the ingredients are there for a potential very serious conflict. Um, it's my judgment that uh, the, the conundrum that China finds itself in today is a very delicate one, and that is that uh, they recognize that by threatening the use of force against Taiwan in an independent scenario, uh, they are alienating the very people that they are trying to bring back into the fold as they see it. But they also recognize, that is they, the leaders in Beijing, that if they were to take force off the table, Taiwan would be an independent nation tomorrow. They know that. So there's a very delicate balancing act, and, and it's sort of a no-win scenario. I think historically, China has judged that over time, with the passage of time, with the deepening integration of the two economies, that of the mainland and that of Taiwan, and with this civilizational sort of common history, uh, common language, although the languages are sort of like American English and British English, they're the same, but they have their distinctions, and so on, history, religion, civilization, there was a sense that over some period of time this problem would work itself out in the mainland's favor and that Taiwan would come back into the fold. The interesting thing that has happened is that with increasing integration, as folks have taken polls of Taiwan public sentiment, and this is an issue that I've tracked very closely over a couple of decades, uh, sentiment in favor of unification has actually gone down. So it's, it's seemingly a case in which um, 
familiarity is, is quite literally breeding a higher level of contempt. And I think the leadership in China realizes that the task ahead is actually not a very easy one. Uh, the United States is wrapped up in this for a lot of reasons, but not least because we have a special relationship with Taiwan that I think you all know about that's basically codified in the Taiwan Relations Act and that mandates that the United States sell defensive arms and services to Taiwan at such a level as to maintain Taiwan's ability to defend itself. And obviously, the implicit point is to defend itself against the mainland. So you know, the US is in the mix. But my judgment is that, at, at present, the leadership of China, at this time, uh, doesn't see that a more aggressive posture is necessary or desirable or likely to get them where they want to get. But they recognize that they are in a conundrum. And I think there may be the turning of the tide in the Chinese leadership's mindset. This is my personal assessment, that time may not be on the mainland side. I also think there's very much a mindset in Taiwan that time is on their side. Because quite frankly, with each passing day, week, year, and decade, whatever connections did exist in Taiwan with the mainland become that much more diluted. Uh, and quite frankly, generations that came from the, ma the mainland die off. And so there's a much more homegrown sense of identity. And ultimately, the mainland Taiwan issue has it all. Uh, two exceptional entities, if you will. Um, you have uh, existential interests at play. You have identity interests at play. And you have significant uh, force involved. And that is a scenario that I look at very closely, and many others do as well. But I think in the immediate term, you know, we're going to continue to see uh, what we've been seeing, which is kind of an effort on the part of all sides to make very gradual and incremental, incremental steps forward within the broad context of maintaining the status quo. Uh, yes, sir. Kevin Kakak, Seminar 2. Is this construct of analysis that you've talked to us about today useful for historical analysis as well? Or is it meant to only be contemporary? Very good question. Um, the short answer is, uh, I've thought about that, and it's a great question. Um, my basic intention is to craft a theory that explains what's happening today and that I believe explains what will happen going forward into the foreseeable future. On a couple of sort of uh, an anecdotal basis, I've tried to apply it in a general way, not, not yet in a systematic or rigorous way, to some past conflicts. What I see is that there are some cases that I think fit the model. Frankly, I think World War II fits the model. Uh, and a number of other cases that we could point to. I think there are some past conflicts that do not fit the model. Um, so I don't think it by any means perfectly explains everything that's happened historically. And the way I would explain that is, uh, number one, I wasn't seeking to look back. But also, the reasons that countries go to war evolve over time with technology, with new ideas about sovereignty, with new capabilities, and so forth. And so a reason that a country went to war in 1650 was different than in 1850, was different in 1945 or 41, and so forth and so on. So uh, I think there is some applicability to past conflicts, but I don't think that applicability based on my own analysis is complete. And um, I think it is more intended to be a forward-looking analysis that I hope will be kind of the new straw man that's out there for analysis, for discussion, for critique, for debate, for poking holes, and hopefully will generate some discussion and some analysis um, at a level uh, or, or around issues that have not yet been at the forefront of analysis of global conflict. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sir, Molly Young, Seminar 10. You um, indicated that exclusionism is controllable. And with ISIS being the most volatile of your list currently, what prescriptions would you recommend to counter that? <laughs> well, great question. Um, l l let, me, let me say as a preface, uh, the reason I chose to work on China, Russia, and Iran <laughs> is because I didn't want to work on the Middle East <laughs> uh, proper. Um, uh, 
So it's an enormously complex region. It, genuinely, it's not my area of expertise. Um, I think the thing that's clear to me is that there is a profound and unbridgeable and ir fundamentally irreconcilable values gap between the civilized world on the one hand and ISIS and all that it represents on the other. By the way, that's, that's, not, an, that's not a West-Islam conflict. That's everyone in the world versus basically ISIS here, including Saudi Arabia, including Iran, including Egypt, all our allies in the Middle East and everywhere else. So I think there's a consensus that there is such a profound gap in the values. And there is such a uh, horrific level to the violence uh, that we are seeing perpetrated by this group uh, that there isn't a soft solution. And, and my analysis, again, not being an expert on ISIS per se or the Middle East more broadly, although I have increasing level of knowledge about Iran, but even that is uh, a relative new area for me compared to China and Russia. My sense is that you know, there isn't a soft or a diplomatic solution to the ISIS issue. I'll be very clear about that. I think there is only uh, an ongoing um, global effort to uh, shut them down. And that's what we're seeing, and I think that struggle is going to be with us for a long time. But there are instances um, where this issue of excludedness and kind of the diplomatic and other elements of the toolkit, apart from military activity, can come into play. We are seeing that presently with Iran, which is, I would say, moving down the volatility ladder toward a place of greater stability in relative terms, because we are engaged in an ongoing negotiating process. As one person said to me recently, if you're talking to each other, you're not killing each other. In a sense, that is the result. So there is some element of that. And I think the idea of thinking of excludedness as a malleable issue applies to Iran in a way that it does not apply to ISIS. Similarly, one could make the case that perhaps it could be applied to North Korea under the right conditions. And in fact, that has been at the heart of US and Western negotiating strategy with North Korea, the idea that there's carrots and sticks and so on. Um, it is being applied to Cuba. But I, I do think that ISIS is a bridge too far. Uh, and, and I think with Iran, even with North Korea uh, and others that are, by the way, state, nation state players, there is enough of some level of commonality that you can sit in the same room and talk with them even if you absolutely disagree with just about with them about just about everything. With ISIS, you can't do that. So there is a limit to that. And I, and I recognize that, but it's a great question. Are we out of time at this point? OK. If so, let me just say once again, thank you so much. I really look forward to more interaction. Thank you. <laughs>